Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast, friends. On today's episode, we have Dr. Tom Vigiano. Tom was a former Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs at Mayo for 17 years. He is currently a named professor, and I'll let him tell you that name, of medical education and medicine at Mayo. So folks, you know, uh, out there in podcast land, you've heard Tom Vigiano's name mentioned by Janet Bickle, by Kevin Grigsby, by many others. Tom is one of our, if you will, founding fathers of faculty affairs. And his involvement and desire to build this community in which many of us are involved, the AAMC Group on Faculty Affairs, from his deep-seated conviction and belief and passion for education and educational scholarship. Tom, would you mind telling us how you know how you arrived at faculty affairs and how that love and um, commitment to education and educational scholarship moved you into a faculty affairs and then ultimately faculty vitality and wellness? Sure. Wow. Um, I'll try. <laughs> I hope my memory will serve me well. I was always involved in as an educator. I just derived a lot of meaning from educating others. And um, so uh, one thing, uh, I was very fortunate to be appointed uh, to the Harvard Macy Institute, the Harvard Macy mm-hmm. Scholars Program. And uh, as part of that program, I designed a research project, and we um, applied quality improvement principles to curriculum evaluation. And so I, I was head of the curriculum committee, and from that experience, I learned the value of having mentoring and funding mm-hmm. to do a little bit of a project. And so back at Mayo, we were we uh, talked with a benefactor, and we got a $300,000 donation that we could use to fund education grants. Wow. And so many of the people that were working in our curriculum designed very innovative things. And we uh, mentored them by, uh, they had to have a mentor, but we also had group mentoring where we would make suggestions to improve their projects. We would, uh, gave them $10,000 and 10% protected time each year that they could spend. So the time was for them to be able to work and the money was for them to be able to access resources. And so, uh, education scholarship, being able to make education a respectable and rigorous academic enterprise within one of our institutions was just a passion. And, and so I, I think it was because of that work that um, it, it, near uh, 2000, 2001, there were surveys about faculty and the plight of faculty. And mm-hmm. One of the surveys was published uh, I think Janet Bickle was on it, and it was it basically found that not one of the medical schools in North America reported that they had in place a comprehensive program to support faculty. And when I learned that, uh, you know, it it it, it resonated because. Yeah. In the culture of academic medicine, people are expected to have the right stuff. Mm -hmm. And if they needed help or if they in any way looked like they couldn't meet all these high expectations, they were viewed as weak. And when you think about it, how, how many casualties there were, people who had aspirations to serve our institutions and their gifts may have been in education, but they bailed out because uh, there were, are only 24 hours in a day. Yeah. Their families are important to them. They knew they would never be respected or rewarded for the work that they did. Mm-hmm. And it was just wrong. And so uh, for whatever reasons, I we began making strides where people were publishing in education, people were being promoted in academic rank. We made an effort to educate our promotions committee. And so I think that was the work that uh, I became identified with. And uh, after the surveys that were published and the dialogue began about how our faculty were just, you know, uh, uh, the onslaught of stress and the factors that were playing out, mm-hmm. um, 
our dean asked me if I would like to be the faculty affairs dean and basically said, I said, sure, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, why don't you figure that out and let me know? Oh and I, I, looking, yeah, it was the best offer ever that you get to write your own job description. But it was, uh, there was so much to do. Um, and so, and I was very fortunate to meet Laura Schweitzer, mm-hmm. Kevin Grigsby, Janet Bickle, mm-hmm. uh, boy, Henry Strobel, and they were kindred mm-hmm. souls. And, and uh, somehow, I don't, I don't take credit really for anything. It wasn't so much my work. It was all of us connecting to serve a cause and then rowing together as uh, passionate individuals who could really be good teammates. Mm-hmm. And somehow we were able to advance things and uh, eventually we got recognized for our work and um, we formed the Group on Faculty Affairs of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I first went, I think it was at the meeting in Seattle when you got the Carol Bland Phrenesis Award. And so I was just new, so I don't know what year that would have been. Gosh, maybe 10 or 12. I can guess. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to guess 2011, the, yeah, but so I'd have to look that up. 10, 11, 12, I and, I, and I remember, of course, like everybody saying, what in the world does phronesis mean? And gosh, mm-hmm. it's Carol Bland, I wish I had known her. And then you went up there and you, you gave such a, you know, a lovely talk and and very humble and i and i thought geez this this is amazing what a huge lift to create something out of nothing and you know as you said sometimes you know people faculty feel like some like their endeavors are not worth it they're not going to make it in this certain pathway and i think sometimes faculty affairs or faculty development has one of those kind of um a feeling like why why are you doing this this is you know polishing the rock of Gibraltar with it with a toothbrush how in the world do you think you're going to make a change or, or move these big huge cargo ships it, it's almost impossible why would you want to pour your heart and soul into this endeavor that is nothing but you know just it sucks you because you just you're just dead at the end of the day you just sucks you dry you feel your heart and soul like you, you feel helpless and so many of the faculty have so many stresses and pressures and how how have you seen this evolve our field and our the state of academic health? Um, ha, do you have any sense of like being able to have a different perspective from those of us who are, you know, new to the game or in the middle of the game? Well, I you know first I'd comment that uh, you know it was um, there wasn't a path. Uh, we we were really in uncharted territory, and. Um, what motivated us was basically injustice, that it w- just wasn't fair what was going on. And that um, I guess the the thing I liked about the group of people that I mentioned, all the people, I hope I you know haven't forgot. There were so many, Valerie Williams, right. oh, Jen Shorey. But I think the thing that motivated all of us was that we knew that it didn't have to be that way. That if that it it wasn't right mm-hmm. and that uh and we it wasn't about us and that we didn't think we were any like change agents or i mean it was about the people in our our faculty the mm-hmm. people that we cared about right. that uh and if somebody had to stand up and articulate you know things that weren't right and we did that by making presentations at the double AMC regional and national meetings. And eventually I think we got recognized that uh, for the value that we could add as the advocates Mm -hmm. for faculty. And um, one of the things that really got us, uh, I remember there was a session on faculty and the plight of faculty and the people on the panel, one of them was a student affairs dean, one of them was nobody from the faculty affairs community. And so we met for coffee and said, we must be invisible. People don't know what we're doing. And we decided that we decided that we 
had a responsibility. It wasn't about serving ourselves or our interests, but we had a responsibility to be the ones that were articulating the the plight of faculty. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do that. It was about serving. And um, I think, you know, your question was about how have I seen it evolve? I, I think it's better, but I don't think it's still where, where we need to be. I think that um, there are still a lot of stresses on faculty. If you look at the literature on burnout and um, there's so much um, that is going on. So I think that we are better in the sense that we do have now offices and resources that serve our faculty. Mm -hmm. The faculty affairs community, the group on faculty affairs is one of the most outstanding professional communities that I think I've ever belonged to. Yeah. And it's a, it's a privilege. It's, it's humbling yeah. to be part of that group. When I see the people that are in that group, you know, my, I just admire them so yeah. The um, but then so I think things are better, but I also think that the pressures have intensified, and so if you were to ask how much better we are at serving faculty, how much of a difference we're making, um, I we still I think we should be humble about the gains that we've made because we're swimming upstream and the current is getting faster, mm -hmm. and. Um, what will serve us best is, you know, continuing to be diligent and rowing together and trying to make progress. But it is better. We're organized, but um, yeah, it, it's so it's frustrating still... because you, you know, I look back to when the GFA then was in, given a name and, and became a thing, and you, you're saying that this came out of the roots of there was nothing and there were these surveys. And this is just ridiculous. We cannot have our faculty um, without any support mechanisms. And so we're going to build it. And it just, so there's a part of me that thinks, and now we're creeping up on 2020, folks, you know, what, 20 years or almost 20 years. Um, yes, we have this community and we're sharing best practices and we're supporting each other. And yet just what you said, you know, the irony is that, are we, as you know, faculty affairs and faculty development folks, are we swimming as fast as the current? It's it's almost like things are changing so fast that it's hard to keep up with. It's hard to keep up with the stresses and the strains. I feel like once we kind of figure something out about a leadership program or some kind of intervention, that the game changes. And like one of our dean folks at, at Hopkins always says gives a metaphor of, you know, academic medicine is like a football game. And here you go with football. Let's not talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it. He <laughs> says uh, football, he's like academic medicine is like a football. He said they're just, there's a lot of people on the, on the field, but the only thing is that academic medicine is harder than football is that everybody has a football. There's not just one football. There are all these, you know, missions and that education and research and clinical and, and teaching and administration and, and on and on and on and on. And it's just, so chaotic and then you know it's it's more difficult because like you're you're cannon fodder and the the, the field of play is even smaller and you're supposed to go 24 7 and they're turning the lights off and oh by the water there by the way there's no water or food left and your equipment's running low and there's no there's nobody helping you with anything you're all on your own and it's just on and on and on i could talk about metaphors but that part of me that gets and i get myself all whipped up into you know, frenzy that I don't feel like we're doing enough. And it, it just it well, frustrates me. Well, it is frustrating. And I think one thing that we lose sight of, because um, one of the areas that you mentioned, you know, faculty wellness, and um, the I mentioned about the culture was, you know, we were, we fancied ourselves as care providers, and we were literally inept at caring for ourselves. Mm. The idea that we might need self-care back then you know there were no resources to help people navigate all the complex tra uh, transitions i remember a defining moment for me uh, after i had accepted 
the role of faculty affairs dean was that a young woman who had young children came into the office and told me that she was she had to quit that she mm. couldn't she couldn't meet the requirements of trying to you know succeed academically and clinically and be a meaningful uh, mother and spouse and she viewed it one hundred percent as her failure oh, and she wow. didn't. Yeah really had no insight into the fact that the system that she worked in was betraying her and that and that it was absolutely impossible for anyone to succeed and why would a humane profession force someone to choose between their family and their work and and so and that really resonated and so um, but I think one of the factors that we don't talk about, I wish we talked about it more in medicine. The nursing literature has published on the concept of moral distress. Yeah, that's exactly So for it. years. Kevin talked to us about ye- that moral injury. Yeah. Crazy. And, and, and well, for years, nurses have been going in. They want to give tender, loving care, and they're so understaffed, they can't even... They have to stay after hours to do volumes of paper, and many people left nursing. Now, if you look at our world, I would argue that, so it's never going to be easy to succeed in academic medicine, and perhaps it shouldn't be easy, but it should be manageable, and it should be doable without, you know, self-sacrifice to the point where it's almost a suicide mission. The... But if you look at our world, the, I think the biggest factor is the corporatization of medicine. Yep. In, in every institution, patients are given less time with providers. Providers are expected to do more. The administration of our institutions says, oh, I should be able to do a procedure in 15 minutes. Oh. You know that, like, I, and we're not making widgets. What we are doing, we're trying to meet highly individualized needs, and there, and, and there are needs that are physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. And so, for example, I'm an intestine specialist, and you have to spend a fair amount of time talking with a person you have to create the environment where they feel safe enough that in the middle of an interview whenever you're trying to get at complaints that you know a lot of the intestinal illnesses can have a stress component that aggravates things and every and I remember that you once you have cared and exuded that by looking them in the eye listening attentively and that the moment comes where they feel safe enough to tell you that maybe they were sexually abused as a child or that there's something in there and we will never get to that in this current thing we will never and we don't we have no way of knowing what we're not what we're missing because the time pressures from the business aspects of medicine and to providers that is enormous moral distress it takes the meaning and the joy out of our work and we Mm -hmm. talk about burnout and resilience and oh and then the dialogue that i don't like about the wellness literature that you hear is oh if you're a little ground down you need a coach yeah. Well, maybe the system's wrong. Fix maybe your, I don't need a coach. Yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah. I need to be able to spend a half an hour holding a hand instead of 15 minutes. Isn't that right? You know, you're so and, right. I, I was horrified when I learned that there are, and it's never dawned on me, I'm not a clinician, that people die alone in hospitals. And when I first heard that, it was very recently, I said, what do you mean people die alone? They said, well, there are many patients here who don't have people with them, and and so they'll pass away, and they'll be all alone in their in their hospital room. And so then, then apparently, there are obviously, as you know, and people are rolling their eyes listening to me. Well, yeah, of course we know this, Kim. There are hospitals where people will be like with the person when they are in their last moments, so that no one dies alone. And I thought, oh my gosh, and how many of our faculty are alone and dying these 
slow, painful, quiet deaths of their career, and they're doing it alone because they yeah. don't know that there are other people out there who have that they're all walking around with this sense of, oh my gosh, you know, the light in me is being snuffed out. I feel like why bother doing education and an educational scholarship? Why trying to build a research program? I can't even deal with the basics. I can't keep up with this pace. And they're dying alone and their careers are dying and their ideas are dying because they feel alone. I think that's the, that's, there's a definite epidemic of loneliness. And at Hopkins, I, I feel it just, you know, when you talk with someone, like as you said, you sit down and after they talk so fast and feel like, I know you're busy. I'm so, thanks for meeting with me. I'm so busy, so busy. But once you actually kind of breathe with them and sit and look at them in their face and and do the mindful listening and real listening, you actually do see that, that people, their shoulders relax. And, and you're exactly right, Tom. We don't do that anymore. We just don't do that with anybody. So and so we're one of rushing the, yeah. and around like, like we're all on fire all the time. Yes, I, and I think that, you know, um, we still live in a culture where I think it takes courage for a person to come forth and say that they need help and uh, and want to reach out. I think a lot of people quietly do what that young woman I talked about. They completely own the problem. It's their failure. They can't do it, and they feel bad about it. They may never tell anybody about it because they're a little bit ashamed of it. Right. But they make the right choice, I hope, to be with their family. And um, and no profession should no profession should set up where um, yeah. there there are there is competition for our time, but we there cannot it cannot approach where it's a constant mm -hmm. conflict. Yeah. And we we but I think that we've not really addressed moral distress, and part of it is. That faculty affairs, one of the wonderful dialogues, I think, the community of faculty affairs in art, as we were forming, we had a fair number of conversations around, and if there were a theme, it would be that we may have influence in our institutions, because we are, we do influence thought, but we don't control purse strings, and so we don't have power. Right. And so to understand the difference between influence and power and learn as a community how we could leverage our influence mm. on the people who do have power so for example i am uh i still think a lot needs to be done to speak out about moral distress about the corporatization of medicine. We are working, providers are working very hard. They're being asked to spend less time with patients. And if you were to look at the administrative structures of our institutions, I am positive we could downsize some of the overhead. And maybe we could cut back a little so that wellness and job satisfaction moral distress would go down, the joy of being a provider and being able to have time to connect with people. Mm -hmm. But as long as it's viewed as a uh, financial um, enterprise and more of a business, and we have a lot of uh, overhead in the, tr in the form of administration, then we're not going to succeed. I would love us to emerge with more of a mindset that leaders in our institutions need to be moral fiduciaries, mm. that they need to understand that their fiduciary responsibilities are to create the environment where patients really do come first, mm. where their safety, the quality of their care, the time that they can spend with providers. And, and, and honest, I think if we were just able to cut back, you know, 15 percent, uh, 20 percent perhaps, but downsize the overhead proportionately, we would be exactly the same where we are financially, and we would have higher morale, higher satisfaction, less turnover in our higher patient satisfaction, safer patient environments, less burnout. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, because uh, I think it, it's common sense that if you were to look at any business, 
you have to manage the overhead. Yeah. You have to. And well, so if we, I, I, I love every administrator that I know. I'd hate to see anybody lose your, their job, but this isn't a personal thing. It's a enterprise thing. Yeah. And it is if we really care about putting patients first, do we not have the moral fiduciary responsibility to create the environment in which patients can be placed first. But we're only influencers. We can't make that decision. But I wonder if the faculty affairs community could move that dialogue along. I'd love to see that. Well, you're, you've hit on something I think that is just so critical. Uh, Kevin Grigsby talked with us about, you know, we ended our discussion and said, you know, what, what should we do? And he said, train your chairs. Department chairs need to be trained and think about pairing up with your business folks. And I think we really need, as a community, the GFA, to think about working more directly with the group on business affairs and and having our finance folks at our own tables in our institutions for the advisory boards of our faculty development and faculty affairs because they really don't know what we do. They don't. Yep. And I think that's been one glaring you know, um, gap that we have a lot of people we invite to our table. We have an Office of Faculty Affairs and Faculty Development. We as a community are good about recognizing the input of our Office of Work Life and Work Life Integration and our HR, Human Resources Friends, and and certainly the hospital side. And I know Mayo has a great reputation, and maybe you want to talk about that as well later, about the culture of burnout and the Tate Shanafelt and a culture that supports and endorses that. So we, we do that, but I think we've not uh, directly or on purpose brought our finance folks to the table to talk with us so that they can understand what we're doing and then perhaps feel, step into the world of faculty other than looking yeah. at them as numbers and RVU generating machines. Uh, yeah. That is... That I think you, you're you're so you've hit, you're hitting that right, and I'm I'm curious and when you were in Phoenix at the big AAMC meeting just a couple of days ago, if you heard what I heard, and that was uh, talking about cutting faculty salaries, and this you know at first I thought cutting they're going to cut faculty salaries yeah that's an easy way to cut costs in the academic institutions, and are are we coming on, upon the time now where do we need to reconsider why that faculty make that much in air quotes do we is are they going to end up you know fixing the dilemma again something else on faculty's backs yeah yeah no i i think that that's uh that's important and you know first let me say you know kevin grigsby has always he was in faculty affairs from the beginning he was one of the founding fathers or or, or mothers um we we were all in it together and kevin is very special because of his expertise in social work and he Mm -hmm. and henry strobel um really they they functioned almost like a conscience in a sense they were always able to bring us back to very important values and value propositions about the work in our institutions and so um, you know, Kevin's work is just wonderful, and his thinking is just wonderful. And I, you know, absolutely love working with him and talking with him. And and uh, I, you know, I agree. He's he's really uh, he's really a great thinker. The um, I don't know that you know, even though Mayo's published a lot on wellness, um, I think this challenge of um, the corporatization of medicine is playing out in every institution, every one of our institutions. Mm -hmm. I don't think the, right now, I mean, if you were to look at faculty members have less time to spend with patients, it's harder to get research grants. I mean, if you were to look at our world and then say, gee, a solution is to cut back on faculty salary, I, I would say that's not, that is not the first step. Mm -hmm. The first step is to manage the overhead. Mm -hmm. The first step is to create the conditions where people were. And then if that were done, and I can only speak for myself, I would voluntarily take, you know, a little cut in salary 
um, in order to yeah. if there's a good fit, help at, finance yeah, that. Yeah, other yes, things, yeah, right. I would, I would uh, to be responsible. But I think that when when you look at this, um, gosh, I mean, you know, I, I worked really hard today. Every day that I leave there, I don't have any doubt in my mind that whatever they pay me, I've earned every every bit of it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't do it for money. Right. I do not do. I mean, but the point is that we do have families. We have we have to make this so that um, the rewards of doing the work and one of the rewards because we do provide for our families is that we're fairly compensated. Right. But I think if I think if we felt that we worked for lean organizations that that focused on what is essential within our institutions. And, and uh, essential to finance the clinical mission, the research mission, the education mission, and the social mission of the of the academic center. I, you know, if if we were convinced that it was really well managed, then then we would be willing to take, you know, do our right. share. But I think of until we would. get right. there, until we get there, I don't think that's. I mean, I I think that. Uh, you know, you're going to cut faculty salaries while you have a bloated overhead. I, 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 so I would advocate not to do that, not for self-interest, but because I don't think it's the healthy thing t- for our institutions. Yeah. But th- th- those are my. But obviously, it wouldn't it be wonderful to have these open conversations, right. not only with the group on faculty affairs, but like Kevin suggested, the group on business affairs, the deans. Right. Sit down and say, we've, we've, <laughs> what is essential mm. about what we want to do? And how can we be very disciplined about allocating our resources that, in a way that it's consistent mm-hmm. with our values and the critical activities that we have to execute in order to enact those values? That's right. Essentialism. There's a great book by that very title that our boss, Dr. Janice Clements, gave to everybody in our office, Essentialism, Moral Fiduciaries, Having Influence But Not Power. This this stuff is humble. Corporatization of medicine. These are very, very important concepts. Moral stress, moral injury. This this is definitely, uh, get, we have a lot of work to do. And, and it, while it's terrifying and it's scary, as you said, when you come home every day and you know you've worked, I'm, I know for many of us in Group on Faculty Affairs, we work really hard. And just knowing that you reached one person, one, even one, just that one day when you touch somebody and they get it and they see you seeing them, they hear you hearing them, and there's that, that wink and that nod and that knowing look is like, okay, somebody's got me. This is tough. I can do it. There are people here who care about you. You are important to us. It comes down to that. It comes down to relationships, and it comes down to people. And I, my old boss back at Rush University Medical Center, Dr. Ali Keshavarzi, a gastroenterologist, he's Iranian. And there's an old folklore about the little black fish. I don't know if it's Iranian. Like, yes, he always he claims it. It says, but this idea of all these little fish in trying to jump out or go into the big big ocean and and i can't remember all the details but one after many 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 tries one little fish finally does get out because they kept saying don't bother don't bother and that one little fish is is makes it all worth it so his reminder to me was you know kim stop you know he'd get back me up off the cliff you don't have to save everybody or you can't save everybody you can't fix everything if there's one person you're you're you know impacting today then it's good. It's a good day, and yeah, absolutely. You know. And along along those lines, I uh, boy, I don't know when it was that I read this, and I can't remember where I read this. But um, along what you said, um, that uh, man's greatest um, hope, man's greatest aspiration, is that she or he would make a difference mm-hmm. by what they serve. Mm-hmm. And our greatest realization is that we are making a difference. And so being able to appreciate, being able to, to for us to be able to, you know, we're always appreciating work, but people to go home at night 
knowing that the world was a little better place because they were there, that mm-hmm. they served a patient, a colleague, a student, a student. Right. that in some way, and, and perhaps you know, many ways, more than one way, their presence made a difference. Right. And that's the satisfaction. That's the meaning that people want. If we were to look at moral distress I, I th- and burnout, I th- my view is a lot of it, you know, Kant wrote about meaningful work. Mm-hmm. So we derive meaning from our work, I think, whenever we are trying and, and we do feel that we are making a difference. And yeah. that's why we go in every day. Yeah. That's what we do. The other stuff, salaries, you know, <laughs> the other stuff, um, you know, academic rank. Yeah. Uh, and I fought, you know, I've done work in education scholarship, and it's an area that I was really passionate about. But it was not, it was about elevating the education enterprise. It was about rewarding mm-hmm. good people. Right. who did good things and whose work was invisible in our research oriented institutions and so and education research now is a it's it's a respectable science and and uh, there's many people there's at our institution at your institution all over where educators are able to help each other we have to get better mm-hmm. at allowing people to connect with the meaning of what they contribute in our institutions. Oh, just beautiful. I I feel so much better. I feel so inspired, and I really, I just love talking to talking to you. This is really, um, it makes me feel good. It's, it's I feel well, like well, we have now, a lot lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, now I'm thinking my new goal is to find those people who feel invisible and let them know. Again, I see you. You're not invisible. I see you. Um, I got you. So a good way, yeah, a good way to do it, um, you know, have luncheons where people can drop in and just talk about what's on their mind, changes that they might like to see within our institutions. One of the most galvanizing things early in, before we became the group on faculty affairs, this was wonderful, and it, it just happened. So in the program of our faculty affairs, uh, I can't even remember, I think it was the faculty professional development group, I can't remember the name, but after dinner, we would have informal sessions where what keeps you up at oh, night? Oh yeah, we love that. Yep, and so, and what happened is that, um, so we were, I remember we were in Utah and Eric Marks, who was at the uh, uh, Uniform Services Medical School, what a character. So Eric had the, the, you know, he grabbed all the bottles of wine that were still open on the tables and he grabbed the wine. Come on, bring it in. Come on. Well, so we all actually had wine in and we closed the doors huh. and it was safe. We were able to say, Whatever we wanted to say among each other, what keeps you up at night? Right. And it was so powerful because that's, you know, we realized that, you know, people misbehave in our institution. The dean tolerated it and we had to clean up the messes, you know. So, the, again, influence versus power. And uh, what is it that we could do? But what came out of it was a group of people that realized that. If we could, if we could organize, if there was a way that we could collectively improve our advocacy for our colleagues, that would be our best chance to make a difference. Yeah. And that's what happened. We, we connected wonderful people who cared about the same thing and it wasn't about ourselves or our advancement it was about serving wonderful people and that's what that's how the group on faculty affairs was born and everyone that attended was a father or mother of that group and deserved recognition Uh, and but it but what what a privilege Mm -hmm. it is and was to be among them yeah. It was wonderful. So yeah. I will always count that as a special. real blessing. Special, special. Yeah. Like uh, 
the first line in Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Life. It's not about you. And this group, you know, our, our group is, they get that. We, we live that. We, we realize it's yep. not about us and it is about the faculty. And, and as you were talking about these, what keeps you up at night sessions and that, that bonding and that sense of community and, and the, the tribe, you know, we're all in this together is just what happens in our leadership programs. And when we bring faculty together, together as cohorts, that's why I kind of worry about putting all faculty development on technology and Instagramming and tweeting and, you know, everything that's electronic, when you're not in the same room with people on a regular basis and building these relationships and, like you said, closing the door, we can't have wine in our leadership programs. Maybe that's an idea. But um, <laughs> we do in the morning. Maybe we can have mimosas. Now, that's a concept. But, they, you know, but, but they get together in a room and it's the same thing. You close the door and they're like an ex, a collective exhale because they're like, oh, I'm not the only one who's worried about keeping it all together and I want to have a baby and I'm going to have a baby and I keep getting asked to go on con- away conferences, but I don't want to because I'm a pregnant or I've got a baby and I, and I can't keep writing grants and it's killing me. And I, the only time I've got free is midnight to 4 a.m. And, and everybody has the nodding of the head like, yeah, yep, yep. And then yep. that sense of, oh, we are together. We, we, we see yep. each other. We, that is so powerful. And, Taking that yep, breath it. to be together is, if we lose that, we're just a bunch of machines running around. Well, that, that's it, Kim. I'd, I'd just comment that, you know, you don't need the alcohol. Actually, I carried a bottle of wine in, but I, for whatever reason, alcohol interfered with my sleep. And I thought, you know, I'd ra- I'll just, I'd rather not drink. So I didn't drink in those sessions, but I can tell you, it wasn't the alcohol. It was psychological safety. Mm. We created a space where anybody could say anything, and you can do that. I think you know if you close the door and in our institution say, "What do you guys want to talk about? Yeah. How could we make Hopkins right. a more effective place for you, for your colleagues? Yeah. What is it that we? What are the things that we need to talk about? Recognizing that." You know, initially, they're not going to be easy conversations, but they're the most important conversations we could have. Uh, you know, that and the other thing that you mentioned that I would underscore is that whenever I'd talk with uh, one of our faculty members who would be appointed to a new thing or they would come in for advice about it, anything, the most important piece of advice that I would give them is that it's not about them, that they will succeed. The the extent to which they will succeed right. is the extent to, it, to which they realize that they have been called to serve yeah. a cause. And if they're authentic in their service and it's not about them, they don't let their ego, it's about really yeah. serving that cause. That's the extent to which they will find meaning. That's the extent to which they will be effective. Mm-hmm. And when you look back on it, you know, I, when, I, I think one of the joys when I think of this community is that you, you're right. Everybody was kind of was programmed that way. We all, it was not about us. It was about serving. Mm-hmm. And wow, what a group yeah. of people. <laughs> what an amazing group of people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, this whole journey, I mean, you and I were talking earlier about how hurdles and barriers where people look at you and kind of have that crunchy face and say, you're never going to make much of yourself doing that. Uh, education is not the place to be. You're you're killing your career. Or my soul-crushing moments where my, my bachelor's, master's, and PhD are in sociology. And my soul-crushing moments were people looking at me with that crunchy nose and curved eyebrow going, sociology, you're never going to do anything with that. Why would you do that? Or, you know, people in my family and friends and colleagues and just kind of looking at me with a really sociology. And I stuck with it. And, you know, I built on that with gerontology and epidemiology. And that was kind of as I identified myself. And I just felt very strongly about trying to understand the social forces in our lives and how that impacts communities and groups of people. And so that was the first thing that kind of made me doubt myself. And then, 
gosh. Oh, and then the second thing was, as you've been talking all along, is about 15, 20 years ago when I first started reading about servant leadership. And people I, I respect a lot, very, very powerful people would say, stop calling yourself a servant. Uh, that's not, I understand what you're saying, like a pat on the head. And I, I get where you're going with that, but you are not a servant. You are, and they would try to kind of, I think they meant well, but I kind of had, I kept, I held on to that and I didn't want to let go of that. And I would nod and I'd say, yes, I understand. I'm not demeaning myself. I, I understand you. But it, I kind of locked that away in myself and said, no, I'm holding on to those things that are me. I am a sociologist by training. I yep, am a yep. servant leader. And so that when you talked and shared with me your story about feeling doubt or being judged or second guessing yourself, something about that, you know, clicked with me. And I think what you're talking about a lot is that that staying true and the, the moral conviction of who you are and what you believe in. And if we're all here because we want to serve and we 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 love that, we have to stick with it, and we can't let people dissuade us or make us feel like you know we're swimming uphill or running uphill or whatever metaphor you want to talk about. Yep, there's a uh, you know along those lines. The the reason your family, um, you know, are you serious about social work is that they loved you and they realized that you were choosing a an area that they didn't see a path for you. I mean, you know, what are you doing? Right. You know, there's better. And, and yet, um, so there's a wonder, a wonderful way to think about this. There's a native American saying about leadership. And I think it applies to, uh, some of the things that I was fortunate enough to have happen in my career and to what you just said about yours. And the saying, the native American saying is there are no paths paths are made by walking. And I think if you keep attuned to what you're passionate about, like you said, you were a so <laughs> listen, this is what I'm called to do. And you, yeah. you just pursue that and you pursue that authentically and, and, and uh, somehow good things happen. And I, I, you know, again, I, I I don't really understand it, but I'm thankful yeah. for the way that works out because I, I when I started education, uh, I, w- I was told by a colleague that I liked very very much, and he became ultimately became my department chair. And we were running one day, and he said, "You're putting a lot of time into education. It's suicide. You're you're going to kill your own career oh. if you want to advance, do research." And I went home and I thought about that and I he was right he was right but then I realized that I didn't have any other option that I'm an educator mm-hmm. and so even though he was right yeah. um, I and I went and talked with him and I I think you know he understood he was nice but I think he thought gosh this guy's hopeless <laughs> but somehow <laughs> Somehow it worked out, and you know, yeah. ultimately he be- he became a real advocate for exactly. you know. But, but so I think you you know, to thine own self be true. You're right. Yeah, Tom. I mean, I, I like that saying. There are no paths. Paths are made by walking. And I just immediately thought of our faculty members who would say, "I want to get promoted. What's the path? Tell me what I need to do." And there's so some can be so concerned with. Show me the path. Show me the path. What do I do? There's a formula. I gotta find the 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 you know the the golden candy bar, the golden ticket. I need to find that that secret. There's no secret. It is like you said, and like the saying is, you just walk your walk. You do but you. It, it, you don't worry about the careerism. Careerism. Do what brings you joy and what you are made to do, and what your innate gifts and your curiosity yep. is, and trust that. Yep. And yep. we're, and P, yep. and you will you will get to where you you know are meant to be. I mean, I'm first generation yep. college student, and if anybody would ever said at some point in the future, Kimberly Ann, you're going to be a dean at Johns Hopkins University, I'd have bust a gut and fallen over and <laughs> cracked my head on, on the wall, and everybody in my well, family would have laughed uproariously as well. And yep, the, here yeah. you go. Yep. <laughs> 
the only advice, you know, the, you mentioned the faculty member that comes in and wants to know the path, what's the secret. And I, the only thing I would say, I agree with you, I would say, well, if there really isn't a secret, but the game plan should be to follow your passion. But remember that you are in an academic institution. And if you want to be promotive, you have to disseminate creativity. Right. You want to serve this cause. You want to be innovative. You want to think of better ways to be a sociologist, a right. gastronomist. But you publishing, disseminating, publishing or presenting or both, yeah. disseminating creativity is the currency of promotion. That's right. But you follow your passion mm -hmm. and learn, and, and we'll try to get you mentors or resources right. or other helpful aids to get you to be able to disseminate your creativity. Mm. But have at it. Serve yeah. the causes you love. Be creative and, you know, improve the way we all think about serving that that cause. Yep. Well, Tom, you've given us a lot to think about, and I feel so inspired. I have two pages of notes here, and the biggest thing is look for invisible people. And I really appreciate you and your time with us. And I can't wait to hear what everybody else thinks. And I'm sure they're going to love you. Would you like to have, leave us with any parting thoughts um, before we say goodbye? No, I would just say, Kim, thank you. Because you're the one that's putting together these podcasts. And you're the one that's putting a lot of time into this. You know, it, my job is easy. I just had to answer your questions. So thank you, because I think what you're giving us is a gift, yeah. and hopefully that will help. Uh, we, we work with wonderful people, and hopefully these conversations will connect with them and help them be more effective at what they do. And uh, that's, that's, that's what our community is all about. That's right. Amen, brother. Well, friends, you've been listening to and learning from and being inspired by Dr. Tom Vigiano. He's at Mayo. He's fantastic. Tell all your friends. Join in the podcast. Till the next time. See y'all later. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.